so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started because I've got a lot of great information to share with you. My name is Heather Bridgman and I'm an assistive technology consultant with Ocali. Not Ocali, it always does it wrong up there. Uh, but that's O-A-C-L-I, the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence. Um, I'm an assistive technology consultant. My background is biomedical engineering and systems engineering. I have a teaching license for high school math as well. So the science field has always been kind of interesting to me. <coughs> And I have Star Bilbush here today with me, helping out with our fun little activity. Mm -hmm. I also work at Ocali, and I help with employment and transition resources and connecting community partners with middle school, high school, and our employment. Okay. So, as we kind of alluded to at Ocali, we are organized by centers. Mine is the orange one on the right, the Assistive Technology and Accessible Educational Materials Center. And um, we call ourselves AT and AIM for short because that's a mouthful. Our mission is to provide access to assistive technology and access to accessible materials through technical support and professional development. So I'm sure many of you have seen these statistics. Um, so just to know that there's going to be 5.5 million STEM-related jobs by 2022. And in thinking about that, um, Every Student Succeeds Act also uh, talks about how to include STEM-related activities, and they specifically mention providing access to students with disabilities in STEM-related activities. So this just speaks to why it's so important to offer these coding experiences as one example of a STEM activity that could be very inclusive for many students. So we're going to hopefully show you ways that it is inclusive, and We'll have some conversation about ways to make it more inclusive as well. So just so we're all on the same page about what coding is, I'm going to show this quick video. Coding is telling a machine what to do. And that can be as simple as um, telling it how to add numbers to telling a car how to drive down the road on its own. For me, it's like playing with Legos. You're using basic building blocks to build really complex things. There are a lot of uh, publicly accessible, what we call high-level languages, uh, which are very easy to talk to. Start giving it basic instructions, and uh, personally, I worked up from turning on and off the of lights to controlling a quadcopter, um, and it really is a simple progression if you put in the time. Um, I've down the blocks to build really complex things. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's like stuck in this little video. Give me one second. Okay. So as he said, coding is basically a set of instructions. It tells a computer what to do. Um, I believe there's some common myths about coding that we'll try to debunk today. One being that when people think of coding, they typically think of very high-level computer languages and, and very heavy text-based languages, which of course that's what it is, but there are many resources out there to make it accessible without having to rely or even understand, in some cases, the high-level programming languages. So just a couple definitions as we move into our little activity. So an algorithm is a list of steps to finish a task. We have, a, and a program is actually an algorithm that's been coded into the computer to tell it what to do. And then we have events. Events are just a basic action, such as clicking a button, turning right, maybe moving forward and things like that. We have sequences, which is multiple steps in a logical order. And it's very important in programming to get those steps in the right order. If anything is out of order, it will kill the whole program work at all. Uh, but that gives us an opportunity to talk about debugging as well and, and how to repair those errors. And then we have loops, which is something that happens <coughs> over and over again. And if you put some code in a loop, then you don't have to write it out that many times. So for example, can anyone give an idea of, of what's going to happen in this code loop? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and how long will it take for that to happen? 
So another way we could say that also is it's going to spin around five times in 10 seconds. Because 180 degrees is half a circle, 360 would be a full circle. But in any case, it's, it's basically, you're absolutely right, spinning a rocket around 180 degrees, 10 seconds. So this is a curriculum, um, it's a website that offers a curriculum for coding that I really, really like. It's called code.org. And what's really nice about code.org, we're going to experience one of their activities today, um, but they have done a lot to make their activities accessible in many different ways. Um, also, to make, uh, we just speak a little bit about equity as well, and, and they really do a nice job of providing what they call unplugged activities. So you can actually experience coding without even having a computer in front of you. And that's what we'll do today. Um, they, they organize their activities into three different types of activities. So we have unplugged activities, bridging activities, and plugged activities. So the unplugged activities are usually with paper, pencil, maybe cups, things that you'll find common in your environment. And then we have plugged activities, which works on the same exact concept of coding, but now you're doing it on the computer with a visual coding language. And then we have what they call bridging activities, which kind of bridges the gap in between the two and starts to introduce you to some of the specific coding languages and symbols that you might need in order to interact with the visual programming language online. OK. Star, are you available? Yes, I'm available. All right, we're going to do this little activity. Did, did you start? Did you pass out the handouts? No, I was talking. <laughs> As Star is passing out the handouts, I will introduce what we're going to do. So we're going to work in small groups, two or three, whatever works for you. Um, we're going to experience creating an algorithm, a list of steps. You're going to be telling your partner how to create a graph um, based on very specific steps. So you're going to move right, you're going to color in a square, move left, color in a square. Very, very basic stuff here. So one person, one person is going to have the piece of paper that has the images on it, and one person is going to have just the grid. Okay, so maybe hide the pictures from the person who gets the grid. And that person is going to be one following the algorithm of steps. best to start in the upper right hand corner. I'm sorry, the upper left hand corner where there is a star on our graph. So okay. I'll be modeling it and there's a star up here on the left. Okay. Yep. So, so what I've done is I've created my list of steps. That's the person who has the images in front of them is going to find a piece of paper, maybe, maybe fold over half of your paper, use the back or whatever, and write down your list of steps for whatever image you want your partner to create of those six images in front of you. Okay, so we're going to model this. So star, yeah. starting at the star, you're going to move one square right, and you're going to fill it in with color. Then move one square right, and fill it in with color. Move one square right. Move so at this point, I want to share a side story. How did I practice this? Uh, it was a web conversation that we had through um, Hangout. And she was like, okay, move right, move right. And so then I'm like, man, she's flying through these directions. And I'm trying to fill them in, fill in the squares, and then realize, wait, she says, fill in the squares. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, good to know. There's no amount of coloring in everything. So then I'm like, so is that image one on the table? <laughs> yes. All right, go ahead. Okay, now move down one square. Yep. Fill in with color. Oh, okay. Fill in the color is a key term right there. All right, move left one square. Move left one square. Move left one square. Fill in with color. Now hopefully the image that she's drawn matches image number one on your example. So good job, Star. Hey. All right, so we're going to let you guys experience. As you are doing this activity, please start to think of ways that we can make this activity inclusive for all the different types of learners in our classroom. Maybe there's, maybe it's already conducive to that. Maybe you have some additional ideas. Okay. Maybe hold on that in case we're, you know, at a loss for ideas. So. Okay. <laughs>
So we're going to give you about two minutes. When it's time, I'm going to play some chimes on the computer. It's going to sound like this, maybe. There we go. OK, well, I stopped it. But OK, so that's going to be your indicator. So the chimes will be your indicator that it's time to come back together. Okay, thanks guys for coming back together for me. So, audience participation. Who has some ideas or some feedback for me about ways you think this maybe already is an inclusive activity or ways that we can modify it to make it more inclusive? to indicate movement or to fill in a space. That's a good idea. Yes. seen this activity modified is you're actually physically moving. So you're taking a step forward, taking a step left, and you're 
kind of moving around a grid just to understand the sequence of steps and following directions and so, yeah. Any other input for us? Yes? I have a math coach who has, she calls it a D-bot. Oh, yes, sure yes. That's a technical name, right? So she's talking about um, a little robot called Bbot, and it allows you to kind of program in the steps by pushing <coughs> arrow buttons, and then it will follow the steps and, and go along a path on a, a large <laughs> plastic grid of sorts. So those are great ideas. So um, talking about universal design for learning, um, there's three main features to universal design for learning, multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of expression. We're gonna focus on multiple means of representation. And that just means creating materials before the student enters your class in a way that's the most accessible to the widest range of users. I keep bumping this, sorry. Um, and so I wanna show you some features that offer universal design for learning that are already built in um, to some of these resources that we're sharing with you today. And this first one is from code.org, which is the one I first mentioned. And it offers text-to-speech for all of the directions on the online activities. This is going to be a real short video. It's just going to read the directions across the top of the page. Oh, golly. My videos are giving me challenges. For this puzzle, snap all of the blocks together in Click Run to watch it go. Okay. So... That's just one example of something that's already built in to the code.org activities. Another resource that's built in, this one is called Scratch. It's from the Michigan Institute of Technology. It's an online visual coding um, software program. And it has low vision supports built in. So you can see on the bottom right corner of the screen, there's a magnifying glass. It's just part of their workspace. And you can click that to enlarge um, the workspace. And then back to code.org, they use a visual programming language called Blockly. What's nice about Blockly is that, well, among other things, it's, you can use it on a touchscreen device. So you can simply drag and drop with your finger just pieces of text without having to type it in. Um, and we'll have a short video about that. Today, we're going to learn to program using a drag and drop language called Blockly. Blockly uses colorful instructions called blocks to build programs that you can use to solve puzzles. Under the hood, you're still creating code. Each puzzle you'll solve with the code is split into four main parts. On the left is the play area where your program will run. In the center, you will see the toolbox area that holds all the blocks that you will need for each puzzle. To the right is your workspace, where you will drag blocks to build your program. Finally, above the workspace, you will see the specific instructions for each puzzle. Don't worry if you accidentally drag out a block that you don't need. If you have an extra block, simply drag it back into the toolbox to put it away. After you hit run, you can always hit the reset button to get your character back to the start so you can try again. visual programming language called Blockly. This is another resource that's built into code.org and they have activities um, that are really geared towards younger students, but I don't see why an older student who might have a reading challenge could be introduced to the same activities using these resources. And you can see here that they have um, programming interfaces and buttons for non-readers. So we're now we're just looking at the arrow keys and we're still, we can listen to the directions and we can still participate in those um, basic coding activities by dragging and dropping the arrow keys, not having to read the text. Okay, so those are things that are built into some of the coding activities, some of the coding resources out there, um, you know, in the, in the mindset of universal design for learning, but there are still gonna be needs by 
other individual specific needs that are not met by that. So that's when we start to enter the conversation about assistive technology. And I just want to share some resources about assistive technology supports for coding. I have this here today. It's over here in the chair. So probably not time to get it out right now, but you're welcome to look at it afterwards if you want. This is called Kibo, it's K-I-B-O, and it's a physical manipulative coding activity. There are little blocks, and each little block has a barcode on it, and the robot is always kind of ready to scan those blocks. So you put them, you always have to start and end with a specific block, but then anything you put in between, the robot will do. So it's just a way to physically interact with the physical robot. Not yet, hopefully soon. <laughs> So here, it's called Kibo, K-I-B-O. And here's a super short video of what you just saw, the blocks that you just saw on the previous screen. Now the robot's going to do it for you. Oh, golly. There's, there's no audience. So I told it to shake, and then I told it to move forward. Well, turn on the blue light, then move forward. Turn on the red light. Uh, move backwards. And I think that was it. So, uh, just a, just a way to understand that you're having control by putting those different steps together. You're actually kind of programming that robot. Okay, this is another one. I'm going to skip this one real quick. This, but just know this is in my list of resources at the end. It's another similar product. It's called Cubeto. Um, it's geared towards the preschool audience. However. I feel like it's not something that looks childish. It's a plain, very plain, nondescript brown box that comes with these plastic coating blocks that are kind of vague looking shapes. You put the shapes in order and then the box goes about and does its business based on the, the order that you put the shapes in. So that, um, that's something to consider if you're looking for physical activities. This is another one, it's called Coding Obby. Um, it's part of the Osmo series, if you've heard of that, which is an iPad. Um, but the really nifty thing is it uses physical blocks to code. Um, and I will show you a little video of that. What are you playing? I'm coding. Each of these blocks is a command Abby follows. Hey. <laughs> Watch this. just by physically interacting with those different blocks. This is another resource that's available to you. Have any of you heard of News to You? Mm -hmm. News to You is probably best known for its weekly picture-supported magazine. Um, but one of the activities they created was a coding activity. And so um, what it does, for example, on the, on the left side there, you're trying to get the robot to the earth. So basically, all you have to do is circle which arrow will get him to the earth, so or to the water. Um, just a very, very basic concept. And then on the other side, it's a multiple choice. So would you, if you're trying to get him to the city, would you go right, right, and down? Or would you go left, up, and left? Okay. So it was just a way to make some of these activities accessible to individuals with significant needs. And this is a really nifty product. It's not quite available on the market yet. It's called Code Jumper, and the intention is to provide coding supports to individuals who are blind or have pretty significant vision challenges. Helen is 
looking for her friends. She thinks they might be in the haunted house. I like to make the haunted house sounds. Meet nine-year-old Joshua Lewis. There's one, she sees a ghost and her friends jump out to surprise her. Today, he's trying out a new piece of tech called Code Jumper, a physical coding language developed by Microsoft for children who are blind or visually impaired. You plug in the pods into the hub and you turn the knob, which is the donut knob, which is, looks like a donut, but it's a circle knob and it's flat and you turn it and then then you can choose sounds. In the summer, I did a little tutoring with Joshua and he was talking about coding and that was something that he was very interested in and he wanted to know what I knew about it. So when they contacted the school, I was like, oh my goodness, this is really exciting that we're gonna get to um, actually lay hands on it and let the kids be able to use it. When I was over here, we made we made a song and it was row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat. And then we made we we made like a haunted a haunted house book. Good design works for all kids. You know when you've got a product that just works because it's intuitive. Students catch on quick, and in essence, uh, learning then begins to happen, and it just begins to blossom. Each pod creates a new line of code that shows up on a tablet, which then turns into musical notes, songs, words, or sounds. So they're physically picking up pieces of code and creating their strands as they go along. The hub reads through all the pods and sends it through the, its speaker and that's how you can hear all the, the information that you had gotten from the pods. Deanna LaFan, a teacher of the blind and visually impaired at Breckenridge Franklin Elementary in Louisville, Kentucky, is one of the first to get it in her classroom. What I really loved was that how um, at ease they are with it because when they came to myself and the other teacher, um, Ms. Allen, that works with me, we were both like, well, we don't know a lot about coding and this, like, this, this, that kind of thing. And then when the kids start using it, they're just like all over it. I mean, they're like, oh, and this does this, and this does this, and you can do this. And it's so much more natural for them because that's the wor world that they live in. If I can get it at home, I would try to do what 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 I can do here with with my family. I would try to make all kinds of creepy noises or anything, but my parents they'll they'll be creeped. <laughs> they'll be thinking that that somebody broke into something. <laughs> Craig Metter, president of the American Printing House for the Blind in Louisville, is working with Microsoft to get CodeJumper in the hands of students all over the world. There's a huge shortage in Microsoft, and uh, we've also heard this from Apple, too. So we've heard this from Google as well, from uh, members of their accessibility teams. They can't find enough programmers. Programmers are in high demand. This is a huge field. You can be blind and become a programmer. Joshua's a natural at coding a skill that could definitely come in handy in the future. What do you want to be when you grow up? An inventor. What do you want to invent when you grow up? Well, flying cars. <laughs> Code Jumper officially launches for the classroom and for individual purchase in July. And for students like Deanna's, it can't arrive soon enough. Assistive technology and um, the, the uh, technology that APH um, has really levels I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and stop it there just because I, we've only got about five minutes left and I want to share with you a couple of other resources. So hope you got the idea of Code Jumper and, and how it can really open doors for individuals who are blind. Um, this is another idea. I have this up here if you want to play with it afterwards. It's, it's a communication device, program some language in. So again, like that activity we were doing earlier, um, if a student is nonverbal, they could have all the commands programmed into their device and they could be directing the activity. Right. Down. I don't know if you can hear that, but... Up. 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 <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. So it's basically just, I can actually pass it around to you if you want. So. I think we made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> So there are even
open coding um, options out there for individuals who require switch access. This is an app, it's called Code for Gold. Um, it's just one of many, but it, it introduces you to some coding language. Uh, and then there's another really neat one out there. Um, it's called Swift Playgrounds. Swift is a language that is used for many of the apps in the App Store. And Swift Playground introduces you to that coding language. Uh, and the whole program is switch accessible. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna show you a little bit of this video, but I'm gonna give you the precursor that individual speaking has very disarthric speech. So you're going to need to read the caption uh, on screen to understand what he's saying. But it's nice to hear him narrate this video. And then I'm gonna jump forward quite a bit in the video so you can actually see how he interacts with the switches to do the coding. Oh, shut. Ah, Christopher? I think there might be a slight problem. Well, you can't exactly touch the screen. So, excuse my language, but how are you supposed to do this demo, let alone build a f***ing app, if you can't use a touch screen? Okay, so now he's going to go into the settings on his mobile device about how to make it switch accessible. I'm going to advance the video here if I can. I can't get at my controls. I'll see if I can get at my controls. Maybe if I turn off closed caption for a moment. What? Yeah, give me one second. I need to advance to, because it's a darn long video. Oh, well, how am I going to do that? Open to suggestions. Can I move that thing? Oh, I could do that. Yeah, good point. But that would require me remembering. Oh, here's the link. There we go. Good suggestion. Okay. So now I'm going to go up to the minute marker 5.21, and you're going to see exactly how he um, does some from Apple activities. that provides kids or adults a new way to learn coding. When you first open the app, you see downloadable lessons up the top and challenges below them. I'm going to open the fundamentals of Swift and complete the first lesson to show you how it works. When you first open it, you'll get an introduction to what you're about to learn. I'm going to jump into the first lesson. On the right is a world that I can interact with. I'm going to use a switch control gesture to pinch and zoom into the world. While I do, notice the cute dude. That's white. On the left, you will get instructions for completing the lesson. Below that, I can tap to enter code. When I do, the commands come up on the bottom. These are just like quick type suggestions, but for code. Very handy from a switch control perspective. I will select move forward three times, then collect gem. When I tap run my code, byte follows my commands in the exact order that I put them in. I have now successfully completed the first lesson. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and pause there. 
but hopefully you noticed the little red box that was shifting around the screen and that was the indicator for his switch and he was accessing the switch with his head. So he was um, interacting with that program just like anyone else would. And what's also really nice about that is it has basically what's known as word prediction. I think he called it predict code or something like that, but it has some buttons at the bottom that, that uh, predict the, the options for him without having to type in all those letters. Alrighty, get back. Okay, so I think we've got no time left, but I'm gonna just quickly, quickly, quickly tell you about some of these resources. Um, if you'd like to snap a picture, that's a good idea. Otherwise, if you give me your contact information, I'm happy to email this presentation to you so that you can have this list of resources. The first three are just very general resources that we offer through our center at Ocali and also the code.org curriculum that I'm so fond of. Um, the next page are some additional coding resources. These are just some different uh, curriculum-based systems that are out there. Um, some of them cost money, some of them are free. Um, so you can explore those at your will. And then here are some physical manipulatives for kids, the ones that I mentioned, like that Kibo robot, Cubeto, Bebot was another one, um, Osmo, Coding, Obby. And then some specific assistive technology resources, which was the coding activity through news to you and Code Jumper. Again, I don't expect you to write all this down. If you give me your contact information, I'm happy to email this to you. And then here are some switch access resources as well. So thanks for your time. If anybody wants to stick around and ask questions, I'm happy to do that. That's a great suggestion. Um, yeah, I, I will definitely consider doing that. Also, the code.org curriculum, I have the book over here, which you're welcome to look at, and it is all aligned to the content standards and grade levels and things like that, all their activities. Yes? You guys have those materials that are probably that uh, we can borrow? So, Star, I think that was a plant. Yeah. She was suggesting that I mention this to you. We have an extensive assistive technology lending library at Ocali. It's available to anyone in Ohio. You can borrow things for three weeks at a time and we pay for the shipping to and from your location. At this moment, we don't have a whole lot in the coding world, but let me tell you, it's on my wish list. So um, it was, uh, I think they're developing some invoices right now and hopefully beginning of next school year, we'll have some of these things in our lending library as well. My name is Heather Bridgman. You can find me there. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I'll stick around. Nobody has any other questions.